Welcome to Policy On Demand. I'm Nita Asher. And I'm Scott McCandless. It is the week of February 27th, and this is your Monday briefing. Congress returns from recess this week. The Senate will be in session for all of March and the House for four of the next five weeks. During this period, the House Ways and Means Committee is expected to hold a March 7th field hearing in Oklahoma City on tax issues affecting oil and gas, agribusiness, and the manufacturing sectors. Both the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee are expected to hold hearings in March on the administration's FY 2024 budget proposals, which are scheduled to be released on March 9th. And the Senate Finance Committee is expected to hold a vote in March on the nomination of Danny Werfel to serve a five-year term as IRS commissioner. The Congressional Budget Office, or CBO, on February the 15th released an updated budget and economic outlook for 2023 to 2033. And, as Scott said, President Biden's FY 2024 budget proposals are scheduled to be released on March 9th. Joining us today to share his insights on these developments is Carl Russo. Carl, welcome. Thank you for having me, Nita. Excellent. So the recent CBO report projects a federal budget deficit of $1.4 trillion for 2023, with deficits generally increasing over the coming years. CBO also projected that if the current $31.4 trillion statutory debt limit is not raised or suspended, the government's ability to issue additional debt will be exhausted between July and September 2023. Carl, could you comment on the CBO projections? So the uh, projection of the deficit uh, for uh, next year assumes that it will be about the same size as the deficit was the, in, in the prior year. And the forecast going forward assumes that uh, all of the currently enacted legislation, including uh, proposed tax increases, uh, will happen as scheduled. Um, so in some sense, it might be a slightly optimistic uh, s projection if there are uh, extensions, say, of the individual provisions of uh, the 2017 Tax Act or of the expiring provisions of the reconciliation bill that was enacted last year. On the debt ceiling, uh, it's somewhat good news that the X date for when we hit that uh, $31.4 trillion limit and exhaust our extraordinary measures is now in the July to September period, as opposed to the June timeframe uh, that the Treasury Department estimated uh, last month. But it will really depend on how strong uh, receipts are uh, when we get the April 15th payments for individual uh, income taxes that are due to be filed by that time and corporate uh, estimated tax payments that are also due around that date. If those are stronger than expected, then we may have a little bit more time. But if they're weaker than expected, then that uh, date might be sooner than the July to September time frame. Carl, with Congress coming back from recess today, do you expect the budget deficits and even the debt limit to be the top focus for members? So the debt limit is by nature uh, been a conversation that happens sort of at the brink uh, when we get very close to, to the date at which uh, the extraordinary membership will be exhausted. And so I think it's unlikely that Congress will turn to it until we will get there. Uh, but I think there will probably be discussions uh, at the staff level and perhaps even at the member level in, in preparation of that time so that they're ready to uh, negotiate some sort of agreement uh, when the date presents itself. Carl, do you expect the president's budget to seek to propose tax increases to address budget deficit, um, even if those proposals are dead on arrival with House Republicans? Well, the president in his State of the Union address did preview some of the proposals that he expects to include in his budget submission. Uh, among those on the corporate side was an increase in the tax rate of the stock repurchase excise tax uh, from 1% to 4%. So I think we'll see something like that in, in, in the budget submission when it comes out. Uh, we might see some things on the individual side as well. Also in that speech, uh, President Biden alluded to the fact of having a tax on billionaires, which uh, may be similar to the uh, proposal that was in his FY23 budget uh, to apply to high income taxpayers. So I do expect that he will have some things in there uh, that, as you said, though, are unlikely to pass in uh, the divided Congress that we have. I think that those are uh, unlikely to maybe even come up for a vote in the Republican control House. And speaking of the, uh, the Republicans in the House, they're going to be doing a budget of their own and trying to show an ability to get to balance over the, a 10-year budget window. Do you consider that to be a heavier lift, perhaps, than what the administration's budget is attempting to show? Well, one of the things that some of the Republican members of Congress have said is that they want to protect uh, 
Social Security and Medicare. We saw that in, again in the State of the Union speech, uh, that uh, there was resistance from the crowd about touching those programs. And if you take those off the table, it does um, make it more difficult to achieve the budget savings that you want with the other programs that are, are left. So you know, if you're looking only at discretionary spending, uh, you'd have to have more significant cuts there in order to achieve a particular budget target. And some members have said that they don't want to touch defense spending, which means you're left with non-defense discretionary spending, which is an even smaller pool. So I think there will be some discussion about what they want to do on that front, but I think you also may see some progress on procedural uh, provisions. So there was legislation that was proposed in the prior Congress um, that uh, would privilege certain pieces of legislation from a process standpoint if they met certain deficit reduction targets uh, by the end of the 10-year budget window. So I think perhaps we'll see some progress on that front, uh, even if we don't see uh, more detailed proposals on what spending to reduce uh, in the near term. Makes sense, Carl. That's terrific. Thank you very much for your insights. Appreciate it. Thank you. And be sure to check out the latest Week in Review with Pam Olson, geopolitical and global tax episodes filmed at PwC's International Tax Conference, and a special episode on recent corporate alternative minimum tax guidance included in the description of this episode. Operational tax episodes filmed at the International Tax Conference are also included in this email. As always, thank you for spending this time with us. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.